Uh, there you go, there you go. Thanks. Yeah. Let's find it here. Uh, people who were who participated in that second section know that I'm fond of slides. So I'm going to uh, torture you with more of those now. Uh, so uh, I, my idea is to present to you guys a case study, but which is uh, both more humble and much more arrogant than anything we've seen today because it connects, it's part of, it's a presentation of something I'm involved in. So uh, it's a very small project, but at the same time, why the hell am I presenting this to you? I hope it will make sense uh, uh, as we go along. Uh, and my idea is to use the case study. In fact, I'm gonna introduce some problems before we get to it so uh, we can appreciate the, the, uh, the case in light of certain specific issues. Uh, and my idea is to do the following. I wanna talk to you guys about a certain problem that I think we face in some people face when they're involved in different political organizations. I want to explain to you how Lazarus comes into the picture in this. It's a bit of a uh, abstract uh, development. And then I would like to present to you, hopefully I'll spend most of the time on this and not get lost on the preliminary comments. Uh, this organization called, which actually has the worst name any organization has ever had, because nobody's ever going to chant this name on the streets or even going to be able to repeat it. It's called the Circle of Studies of Idea and Ideology. It's the longest name. And we didn't know that in English it would sound like CSI, which is also not that nice. But, you know, you take what you can get. So my idea is to go about, about it like this, to talk about the problem of uh, political thinking in a very specific approach that is not necessarily Lazarus' approach, then I want to measure Lazarus, Lazarus' contribution against that formulation of a problem. And then propose uh, that this case study is also a case study on how to develop that problem in part in, uh, in a way that confirms or helps perhaps to clarify some of Lazarus' ideas, but also in another part, something that goes slightly in a different direction and might be useful or not to you guys. Uh, I decided to do this, uh, let me say this beforehand, because uh, this organization is now be go being here for around 10 years now, and we're in inside the organization, we're going through a sort of balance sheet moment. Uh, we're kind of seeing what the hell we actually did in the last 10 years, and uh, I'm actually gonna, this is part of the problem I wanna bring and talk to you guys about, so we'll get to that at some point. So the problem that I, I mentioned is that I think that the question of, people think or political thinking or politics as a thought can be formulated in a very, in a slightly more concrete way in the following way. Is the thought of, first of all, before I go on, can you guys see the screen, okay? Is it readable? Yeah, okay. So we can translate that question in terms of, is the thought of an organization, the thought of those it organizes? So when we talk about politics thinks, politics is a thought, are we, by saying this, committed to the idea that, well, if people think, then the thought of politics is the thought of individual people. And could it be something else other than that? And uh, I think that we can see this issue in a very concrete light uh, if you kind of uh, derive four specific issues from this bigger theoretical question. What I call the problem of autonomization, which is actually very simple thing. Uh, for example, in my experience in Brazil, there is almost a law of a critical mass of organizations, which means the moment that organizations have, I don't know, more than 20, 30 people, when certain protocols are necessary for things to get organized, when you need to come up with rules that are more impersonal because you no longer can trust only personal ties or personal connections to coordinate actions. When, in other words, when an organization gets autonomized in, this, in the least from those that it organizes, uh, usually that's the main breaking point for organization. It's almost quantifiable in terms of how many people statistically you need to break into two organizations. One will call the other authoritarian and will call itself the true uh, organization. This can sometimes go on into a process of scission, as Althusser would call it, up to the quantum level, you know, 
you should definitely come up with the term quantum Trotskyism when you split organizations up to the where you are part of both two of them so below the individual level so I call the autonomization the problem of that critical point where organizations become larger more structured or or different even from what the people who are organized by it want it to be think it is some level of consistency of the collective is in excess of the individuals that compose that collective. And I find it very interesting that most of the terms we have traditionally in political theory on the left to describe this process is an, are negative words. It's a deviation, it's bureaucratization, it's ossification, is detachment from the base. It always, the way that we tend to perceive the autonomization of an organization from those it organizes and the emergence of something we can no longer reduce back to our own direct coordinations. There isn't much theory or thinking available, at least that I don't, that I know of, or outside of very abstract philosophy, to say what it means to surf or to use or to benefit from that tendency, right? What, it, what can you do when you're organized in such a way that organizations are bigger than you. And I think that it's not for nothing that when this happens through the state or through a party, we don't feel so uh, threatened by this process because that's, why, that's what these forms name. Well, what's in excess to me is the state. So if my organization is in excess to me and it is therefore parliamentary or it's a movement that is that has clear goals with regards to the state, this can be managed. Or the party form, think like this. So when you're organizing more autonomously and this happens and you need to deal with it, this becomes a bigger problem. So that's one of the terms. Another problem concerns political words in the sense that it's easy to, to see the mismatch between organized and, or, and, the, and the organization. When you see an organization that, for example, relies heavily on women's domestic work, so that men can be at meetings where in the meetings they talk about feminism, social reproduction, uh, you know, sexual division of labor or whatever. So you can get organizations that materially rely and are thinking in a certain way, but the words that we use and the words are supposed to legitimate that we are going somewhere else. So this can happen in the most distinct ways. For example, if you have a meeting to talk about workers or that you're inviting workers, you're probably going to get a lot of white academic students here in Brazil because workers don't necessarily recognize themselves in that way. So those terms don't necessarily refer to what we think they do. So our organization is actually going one way while we're talking about something else. There's a certain mismatch between what an organization does and what we represent it to be doing, let's say. The third way that this problem appears in practice is the difficulty of assessing a failure in an organization. If an organization relies too heavily on the image that it is on the right path and the, on the recognition between the organized people that uh, we are on the right side of something or that we are, we, we are morally superior or that we identify in certain ways, there is almost an inverse proportion of how much we rely on representation and identification and how much failure we can admit that we have or that we went wrong. For example, men meeting to talk about social reproduction and feminist problems, sometimes they're so identified with that discourse, it's so important to distinguish them as a group that to admit failure to actually consider that question practically might dismantle the group that was talking about it already. So you can see that there is almost an inverse proportion, proportion between, again, let's say, the information you extract out of what you're doing as an organization and the capacity to, let's say, absorb that information about a failure, a lesson learned, depending on how organizations represent themselves to themselves. So, again, it's a matter of questioning if what we're thinking is actually what an organization is thinking. Finally, I, I think the problem of cognitive mapping is also interesting. It's, it's Jameson's, Frederick Jameson's terms, but uh, it's almost an epistemological approach. He treated, treats it more as an aesthetic problem, which I think it also is. But the question is, are we sure we can see 
political reality individually or are aspects of political reality only clear to us, only sensible or even no uh, uh, intelligible true political organization. So in my personal life, I will never find certain barriers, uh, realize how certain forces work. Whereas when I'm organized and trying to get certain things happen, you can see new barriers, new obstacles, new ways of framing what's going on. So somehow there's a, a level of reality that gains sensible uh, weight, true organization. Again, we see a mismatch between what I experience and what is, let's say, opened up by the organizational platform as, let's say, means of experiencing. I wouldn't be able to experience that by myself. And even when I experience it in an organization, it doesn't mean that I experience it as a strong fact or something that is, let's say, in my own measure. So all those problems concern how thinking operates in politics in a certain way. But you see, I'm starting from a very, very, very local, localized way, not as a general theory, right? So I think that we have three big answers. I'm being very schematic here, but I also want to go quickly on this part on how we can answer or, or start working through this question. Uh, political philosophy has an answer to who thinks politically or, or where is thinking in politics, right? The idea, for example, that we abstract from political action or from some contemplation on the nature of politics, some thinking about it. Uh, we could say, perhaps, I think it's a very reductive view, but just to distinguish from it, Leninism as saying, well, political thinking is part of, let's say, is an interior part of political strategy. It concerns consciousness with regards to political ends. It's more imminent and it's not so theoretical in the sense of an abstraction from a struggle, but it is a process of abstraction inside a struggle. But the mediating term there perhaps might be political strategy. So summarizing it in this way. And I think this is helpful to see how Lazarus is bringing us even closer uh, with his idea when he says, well, pol political thought is what gives the political process its interiority. So let's not move outside of it and let's not identify thinking with a consciousness, but thinking will be something that is at stake in a political process. So it's already something that starts to give some conceptual background to the problems that we were mentioning before, because we are allowed to ask the question within politics, but about what the hell is being thought, right? Uh, so my point is that I don't want to start from any of these three perspectives. And this is why I'm presenting you guys with the case study. Uh, I don't want to start from theory. I don't want to start politics from strategy because you need to know something before you can strategize. But I also don't want to start with an inquiry. In the collective I'm part of, we start from the fact that we are quite lost. That's our starting point. We don't really know anything that's going on. Most of the people who join our organization are identified with the fact they're totally disoriented, not with the fact that they know what the hell is going on. So not only don't we have a clear theory, we don't have any clear strategy, and we have no anthropological interest in getting to know what is being thought somewhere else. So this already places us in a, let's say, uh, bivalent relation with regards to what Lazarus is doing, because at the same time that he's definitely an important uh, author in bringing thought into politics, uh, at the same time, as Neil Cosmos said, I think that was very important that he said this, that somehow political, uh, the thought of politics, uh, he said the, poli the thought of politics has to go through anthropology. So there, there remains a minimal distance and I'll return to this. So this is how I understand very simply in two, the two statements that Lazarus proposes. People think means thinking is not a prerogative of theory. It happens out there where political processes are taking place. This we can affirm without making, without checking anything. We're just stating it as an axiom, let's say. Now, what is thought, how it, it is thought and where, that concerns the singularity of each process. And then he has the second statement, thinking is a relation of the real, which says something like, to learn about the singularity of a political thinking, one must be able 
Uh, one must abdicate of exterior approaches that turn political processes into real objects of sociology or discourse analysis and learn to think how a given process constitutes what is real, its subject matter, within its own interior unfolding. So I really like like little diagrams. So you can imagine people think as a sort of determination of an indeterminate boundary. We don't know what the hell goes on there. But we're saying that things happen inside, uh, uh, as, uh, as Daniel mentioned, and everyone also returned to the point, things that are happening inside a certain site. In a certain location, something is going on, and it has the resources to say what it is in, in, in some terms. And the statement two, thinking is a relation of the real, means within that site, something unfolds imminently to it. And thinking is the emergence, a certain interruption, as he says, uh, of what is at stake, what we find out as we put certain terms to, to, to the use, as we start moving around, coordinating things, something becomes at stake. It might not be what we want it to be, it might not coincide with what we say it is. We can use the word wages to talk about a, a, a fight for dignity and not for wages. But somehow around that term, something will coalesce or, or, or condense. Right. So it's very nice because it doesn't treat organizations and move and social movements as objects to be abstractly analyzed. It is capable of distinguishing the use of circulating notions, right? These words that we use that we extract from theory, from the actual use of concepts and ideas inside a certain reference uh, site. And it conceives subjectivity as distinct from subject-object relations, even though it doesn't abolish this. It's not to, it's not a philosophical thesis on what subjectivity is so much as about what is subjective in politics, right? So subjective here will mean it's a process seen as a consistent interiority. Subjective is, let's say, the consistency, continuation of this unfolding of something that is at stake for some people. Uh, now, as uh, Neil Cosmos said, and I think that uh, Robin was also very, very keen to point this out, and, and uh, which I think is very crucial, is that this rem remains uh, an investigation, which is perhaps not in exteriority in the sense that Lazarus means, but let's say exterior to a political process. So the, what Lazarus calls a reiteration, he says, we want to think what politics thinks. That's a reiteration of the word think. But one thing happens inside politics, a political process is thinking, and the second happens outside. It happens outside in great intimacy, in a practical sense, in an inquiry sense, but it still is something that doesn't concern people who are doing stuff. Like, I don't care that you're saying that I'm thinking. I'm, I know I'm thinking, or even if I don't know, perhaps that's not even my question. So there is still, let's say, a, some level of exteriority that I think substitutes a problem of mediation, which is, I think is why both New Cosmos, Robin, uh, both introduced the problem of dialectics again and said, look, but I'm not, not sure this really requires us to give up on dialectics or, or anything like this. So uh, in a certain sense, uh, Lazarus puts us still outside of an interiority, no longer exterior to it, but outside of it. Let's use that distinction just to make, to clarify things. Now, uh, I read Lazarus together and against, and I'm sorry for the very geeky, nerdy part, uh, with Badiou's text called The Concept of Model. Uh, in The Concept of Model, Badiou gives a definition of modeling that seems very, very scientific and mathematical or whatever, but it actually has very interesting consequences for non-mathematical practice. Because he says, look, a model, uh, the concept of model concerns the articulation of formally homogeneous, but conceptually heterogeneous systems. So a model relation in mathematics concerns a formal system, S1 here, I'm sorry that I'm putting you guys through this. Uh, I don't have a way to, to, to highlight it, but okay. A system uh, that is encoded into another, and this system runs its own uh, functions its own implicative structures, and we decode back to the first. If 
running the implications of one system is the same thing as encoding it into another, running the other system, and decoding it back, this S2 system is a model of S1. Now, the crazy thing is they're both formal machine. There's nothing qualitative about them that distinguishes them, one as the thing being modeled and the other that's modeling. They're homogeneous, qualitatively indistinct in that sense. But when we put them in this relation that should be a relation of equivalence, right? We're saying that one thing is equivalent to the other. The fact is that they, by playing heterogeneous roles, you actually learn something new. So if you, for example, model logical systems through algebraic structures, you're going to learn something new about logic. You're not going to just get a tautology. So the funny thing about this is that you have a homogeneous uh, pulse relating in heterogeneous ways. Now, uh, it's true that this is how it operates in mathematics, but in physics, it can operate in this way. Either you will translate numbers, uh, it translate data of an experiment into numbers, and then relate numbers to other mathematical structures, so the homogeneity is guaranteed, or you will create, for example, a physical model, like a small scale uh, model or something to mimic and simulate what happens in a big scale physical process. Again, homogeneity, Two things are physical processes and heterogeneity. I'm going to learn something from my small scale model about the big scale model. Now, Badiou says this, and his examples don't concern science. His examples concern exactly the same thing as Lazarus' example, the human sciences and sociology. And he says, well, the notion that of modeling that the human sciences use is inverted because it tries to relate heterogeneous things like kinship relations in a social system to climb groups in mathematics, and, but relates them heterogeneous things in a homogeneous way, right? And I think that Assad's example with, uh, about uh, the idea that social science can, come up, can be formalized in some, doesn't need to be mathematical sense, but in some economic theory and something like this, and then we can instantiate this uh, into social reality. And, describe how it functions, things like this, they all play into the same, same notion, right? The inverse relation is also possible. You can say logical systems uh, will, uh, they are, let's say, ahistorical frames of how things work. Actual reality is how we use these, these terms or concepts. And these two heterogeneous things can come into relation. For example, we can correct the use of concepts in reality through a formal system that tells us how this thing should actually work. So you see both these cases, one of the terms is equated with reality, the other is formal. One is representation in the formal sense, the other is reality in a non-representational sense. Uh, so for Badiou, a modeling relation is an imminent articulation between homogeneous fragments of a system. So both things are made of the same stuff, but the folding of one onto the other is heterogeneous and reveals something, right? He uses this very basic insight about models and, and these conditions for models to be more concepts of, to apply to the concept of modeling to later on come up with this theory of generic procedures within which politics is affirmed to be a thought because political processes can model themselves without the mediation of the state. Right? If, you are, if you are into being an event, the state represents a power set of a set, but you can, and that's a way of modeling a set, but you can also model it through what he calls generic sub, uh, supplements, which are alternative models that are imminent to, to the situation. So you get a sort of introduction of a reflexive arrow where the reiteration of thought happens inside the political process and not through anthropology. It's funny because the same movement that opens up a space for, for philosophy for Badiou also makes politics more imminent to itself than it is for Lazarus, in my opinion. Whereas Lazarus says, we don't need philosophy, but he keeps the anthropology there, whereas Badiou reintroduces philosophy to say that politics doesn't need it. A very interesting move. So my moving from Lazarus to Badiou allows us to say that to think politically the thought of, of politics, meaning not to think anthropologically, but to think within politics itself, we need both the interiority and this sort of continuous process 
that Lazarus talks about that touches on the subject matter of something, something erupts as what is at stake. But it, we also need this reiteration to be imminent to it. We also need to be able to ask ourselves within politics, what the hell were we thinking? Or what the hell are we think, doing while we're saying we're doing something else? That level of this junction between what we think we're doing, what we're actually doing uh, and thinking uh, is precisely the thing that in that problem in the beginning I mentioned as a necessary disjunction that we need to learn how to deal with, right? So this brings us to the case study. I hope I still have some time. Uh, the, this organization is called the Circle of Studies of Idea and Ideology. It's, a, it's mostly a Brazilian organization. Uh, today, it also exists in, in the United States. We have members in other places. Uh, the, the name, as I said, is Circle of Studies. Uh, we took this name very pedantically from a bunch of philosophers. So if you read our original project from 2011, it was all about studying and, and disseminating Rancière, Agamben, Badiou, and Zizek's work. So it was a very kind of uh, theoretical project. That's why it got it was allowed to have such a corny name, such a long name, because it was supposed to also kind of place itself in the same line of other organizations, such as the Circle of Epistemology, uh, which happened in the 60s in France, the Russian Circles of Mathematic Exercise, which was something that happened in the beginning of the 20th century, which was also an autonomous center for studying mathematics in the case. Uh, this is a basic timeline of, of our project. So it starts around 2010 and goes all the way to the present. I just added some stuff here that is relevant across the years and you'll see later on why I'm bringing this up because this is part of what I wanna to talk to you about. So the project started while we're still, we still had a leftist government in Brazil, Lula's second mandate was coming to an end and Dilma was about to be elected. Uh, some of us were part of a presidential campaign for uh, uh, candidate was similar in a certain way to Bernie Sanders. It was called Plinio Jahud Sampaio. He was the candidate for a, party, a recently created party called PSOL, the Socialism and Freedom Party, something like this. Uh, I was part of it, others were part of it, and PSOL was trying to solve an issue that it had, which is that it had, it, it was created out of a bunch of fragmented tendencies from other parties, and uh, that were and dissatisfied with the left at the time, but it didn't have any internal cohesion. And it didn't know how to kind of prepare new militants as well. So they wanted to create a center for revolutionary studies. And that's where we came in. Me and others, for example, Dennis Chiao, I think he's here uh, in the meeting. Uh, we were at the time studying uh, new ideas for political organization. And we saw it as a chance to put them into practice, to get together with Saul in this, in the creation of this center. The idea of the center was destroyed in like a week because each of the party tendencies didn't trust one another. So they said, we cannot work together to create a center for theoretical training of militants because we don't agree enough about what militants should learn. Uh, so the idea was dismantled, but we stuck with it and we decided to move forward with our own version of it. So we created a circle, it started in Rio de Janeiro. Around 2014, it expanded to Sao Paulo. Then in 2016, it expanded to three other states. Uh, it also created a cell in the United States, which still exists and exists until today. A lot of stuff happened in the, in the, in the middle of this. I'll get back to it because it will help us to talk about perhaps a bit of saturation as well. Uh, so, what I wanted to, to show as, 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 let's say, the backbone of the case is that we were created as a center for political formation. I don't know how you say this in English, like for theory courses for militants and things like this. In one year, we changed the nature of the organization and it became worried about how do we help the party to, be, to consolidate its ad administrative structure? So how do you create uh, the infrastructure that the party needs to accommodate all the different tendencies, the different focuses of the different organizations inside of it. By 2014, we realized that organizational problems were central to political uh, uh, 
struggle in Brazil and in, in and our guess was to peripheral countries in general where social formations don't really re, uh, produce the homogeneity required to solve certain basic organizational problems or organizing in those conditions is different. By 2016, a lot had changed and we started creating projects to help uh, militants and university students who had uh, problems with money and material conditions. And we were no longer doing as a group campaigns and political work with a party and, and nothing like this. And more recently, we started doing a balance sheet of our previous efforts under the idea that something went wrong or something is no longer working and we need to assess what it is and see what we're gonna do to remain effective in the current situation. So why am I saying this? Because something, something must have gone right because we were able to be totally wrong about what we should be doing and not disband as an organization, which is one of the problems we were talking about before. The organization was created with a concern of being plastic enough and having enough mechanisms uh, in place to absorb failures, to absorb the fact that sometimes we don't know what we we're doing and we only find out in a second moment that we were doing something different than what we thought or that what, what was effic efficacious about it was something that we didn't consider uh, that was serious. So that this history can have turned from campaigning and theoretical work or didactic work to something that concerns suddenly popular finance, uh, working with uh, slums to come up with uh, private funds of money that they, they can have like, I don't know how you call this in English, like a loan, uh, popular loan system, things like this. This change that didn't re require any break in the organization, I think is due in part to the way that it is structured. And this is what I wanted to talk about and present to you. So this is the basic minimal unit of this organization. And this has been in place from quite early on. It took like a year for us to establish that this was the basic idea. So what is this? It says that anyone can join our organization. We don't even ask questions about politics. If you fill in a stupid form that we have that says, doesn't ask any questions that are of political ideological nature, you are allowed in. Now, people are not uh, in the organization because they, they were admitted into it. They're only in the organization if they write an anonymous annotation or a note from one meeting to a cell to the other. So if you come to one of our meetings and after it, you write a small note and you send it to us, it's like you punched a card. So you're still working with us, let's say. If you stop writing that note, we understand you no longer are part of the organization. So to belong to the organization means to be consistent in this formal engagement, doesn't mean to agree with anyone in particular. And the, the annotation is not only anonymous in the sense that nobody will know it was you. Uh, we, we, public, we make public all the annotations ever done in our organization. We're probably the organization with most material online ever. Like imagine 10 years of weekly meetings in like four or five states. So we, we hide from the public eye through excess of information, not from absence of it. Uh, and if you do this, you can keep coming to the meetings. If you don't do it, you, we understand that you no longer are interested. So what you get is that we have a very heterogeneous mixture of militants coming in because we don't have particular emblems. We don't say what we stand for. We see if people stand being, like if they tolerate being in an environment that is that heterogeneous. If their political positions doesn't tolerate that, they probably will prefer go elsewhere. If they tolerate that sort of organization, then they can stay. And we do have anarchists, all sort of communist thinkers, socialists, people who don't care about politics, they just like the company. We don't ask that sort of question. And in principle, it's for us, it's kind of irrelevant because that's not really where we organ start from organization. So people come with different organizational problems. Sometimes they are in our group and they are in a party. They are in a trade union uh, organizing. They are inscribed in many different projects. 
some of these projects don't really go well together. Some are hardcore kind of Brazilian Communist Party militants and other are hardcore anarchists and they are both in the same organization. What happens is that they all create these annotations from one meeting to the other, where they, for example, complain about one another, or they say that the only politics that is good politics is this one, or they complain about the organization, like you guys say you're such good commies, but I don't have bus fare money to come to the meetings, like you hypocrites. So in the next meeting, when we read all of these, new problems emerge. And people who are actually saying, supposedly saying things that don't match the anarchist guy, the commie guy, they might have written very similar notes. So the way that their problems are now mashed together is not something that any person thought in particular, because the way that we're going to put these things together, God knows how it's going to go well together or not. So what we do then, which is the second level of the organization, is that we take these problems and rather than saying, okay, get out of here, or this organization is not for you, if you don't like something that some other person is doing, we say, why don't you go and create a subset, a group inside the organization that does the thing that you think should be done? If you think what's missing is serious theoretical study of Marx, go do it. We'll help you. People who are in the organization are web designers, teachers at a university, or whatever. They can help you out with that. So we don't really block any ideas, and we don't decide who is right and who is wrong based on ideological discussion. We organize so that people can actually put together groups that do what, they're, what they want to do with the smaller consensus groups that they can meet, find for people who want to do that thing with, the, with them like a club, perhaps, right? So the validity of the problems and solutions are decided through the creation of these smaller groups that then gain some autonomy and work on their own. But since people are a subset, these people are a subset from the circle, so they also go to the cell meetings and we still get information about what they're doing through these annotations. So they might say, well, you know, we thought studying Marx would make us feel better, but it's not really cutting it, you know? Or others will say, uh, we decided to work with a certain perspective together with a trade union in a certain project and it didn't pan out well or it was a really good and we learned this and that. So these things are interjected as a feedback into the organization. For the more mathematically inclined, you will realize that subsets concern the, the power set of a, of a set. So there is already like a flavor of modeling problems in there if you're interested. So uh, a lot has changed throughout our history concerning what we did in this meeting. So for example, in 2012, we used to do political theory classes. If you came to a meeting, you would see usually me acting like a big teacher and writing complicated stuff on a blackboard and saying, you need to know this to be a serious political militant or something like that. And very quickly, this became absolutely untenable or uninteresting even because Nothing would come out of it, and we had many problems with this, uh, mostly organizational, either because you could see who was actually coming to the meetings and it wasn't that equal at all. You could see how intellectuality, especially in a place like Brazil, is a very important uh, socially distinctive operator, so people who understand, people who don't understand. There's a lot of uh, humiliation to be in a, in a room where people are talking with big words and thinking that that's very important. There's also uh, uh, there was already not, not very much interest from the party that I mentioned in kind of supporting this idea. So a lot changed about what we do in these meetings that kind of brings together this heterogeneous group of people. And a lot changed in the sort of subsets that people decided to create as we went along. Out of the problems that emerged, uh, from bring, being, being put together with people with different political attitudes or political backgrounds as them. So, of course, group studies for all sorts of classical or important thinkers. We put together academic or non-academic conferences. We came up with, in partnership with the PSOL party, we created base organizations in different cities and locations. Uh, we gave, actually did give some theoretical course for military information, campaign work, but slowly something changed. And I'm 
this list is not uh, exclusive, it's cumulative. So these things remained, but they were added on to things that don't really look like it. So with the pass of, passing of time, we were starting to get calls to, be therape to give therapeutic assistance to organizations because militants were suffering in the organizations. Uh, we started coming up with solutions to those problems based on taking into the consideration the fact that militant work is actually a sort of work. It's also a way that you use your efforts and your time. And in a situation of large informal uh, work structure like we have in Rio and Brazil, the way that you need to choose between doing political work or surviving sometimes is not really taken into consideration by organizations in such a way that political work becomes a very super egoic, excessive uh, imperative on top of all the imperatives you already have by trying to stay alive and have a decent job or family or something like this. So we realized that something had to be done, uh, something had to be changed in a way that we approached political life, where the question of militant work would be kind of included into political economy, a sort of political economy of militancy, because we couldn't conceive militancy anymore, activism or whatever you want to call it, as something that breaks away with the social discourse of the uh, management of time. So an organization that doesn't know that it is managing someone's time, consuming someone's time, that it is distributing and reorganizing that time, uh, doesn't, is not really thinking, in our opinion, what's going on, as I say, what's at stake in the life of a militant in Brazil anymore. So I'm just trying to show here that we have a scansion in the middle of our little existence, where we began with a main articulation with a party. Our political discussions were about what is the role of electoral politics and what is not, how we go beyond the state, things like this. Our this theoretical discussions were mostly around the history of socialism, how much socialism, uh, of, how much of this history should you inherit, how much uh, symptom there is in the sort of absolute avoidance of this. Uh, and we focused a lot on philosophical discussions with the sort of new communist thinkers like Badiou, Negri, and those guys. Somehow, nobody decided on this. This is no one's idea. That's the funny thing. Something changed, and the sort of project and theory and ideas and way of speaking that we started uh, using after a while was much more focused on social reproduction issues within militant organizations. So it was a, a view to the inside. It was an uh, attempt to focus on the question of political economy of militancy, a reevaluation of how we talk about money, about time. Uh, we started coming up with projects for self-sustaining militant work, where the idea that you're doing something that needs to be somehow uh, recognized as work should be included in the way that we organize. And we started being called and also coming up with projects that take into consideration how this level of organization and self-reproduction of organization affects the militant subjectivity. Uh, we understand today, and this is the balance sheet moment that we are doing, that this change happened, this scansion has something to do with the, the way that 2014 and to, between 14 and 16, the crisis of 2008 really affected Brazil. It, it was like delayed a bit. It, the, we had the impeachment in 2016 of Dilma. We, we were very much involved in municipal ele elections in 2016 and all the campaigns we were part of failed miserably and in ways that had to do with the way that they exploited militant work. Uh, and the feminist movement also came to the fore in Brazil, and, and it was already, of course, very active, but it became, in my opinion, the central category of, of or the central force of mobilization, especially once Bolsonaro uh, was elected, between Dilma's impeachment, our first women president, and Bolsonaro's election, uh, whose main opposition was women in the streets with a particular slogan, not him, ele não. I think the feminist critique coming to the fore was also an influence, but it would never have been possible for us to rethink what we were doing or even think what the hell it is we were doing before if the structure of the organization couldn't somehow absorb that failure or that saturation of that way of talking about things. 
So saturation for me here, I'm not necessarily saying that it means what Lazarus mean, it says it means, but I think a very good way of understanding it is saying that political words are, are born, they, they are kind of baptized by certain reference and certain struggle, but they can have a life that exceeds that reference. So political forces can change, political subjectivity can change, uh, social relations can change, and the names remain. And it's saturation in the sense that anyone who, I mean, I'm absolutely kind of addicted to sugar. So I know what saturation is every time I drink coffee and I put so much sugar in it sometimes that like doesn't even uh, get mixed into the water anymore. You know, it just condenses in the, in the below. And I think a lot of political words are like that. And a lot of our political words and our political concepts started to be in the bottom of the organization, like this remains that no longer really mix together with the movement of the political coffee, why not, right? So just to conclude, what, a, what I think that uh, we learned in the process is that if you look at this very crazy graph here, imagine that this line here, right, it, it's where uh, is inside of this process of the circle. Uh, people are admitted, anyone can come in, so we get a heterogeneous group of people together. When you try to create something that, that has some equality amongst different people, you find out that equality is impossible in the technical sense that impossibility is something that bars a certain formalism from fully deploying itself, right? So problems emerge. And what we learned, and, and for it's, I think it's singular about this particular process, is that we don't try to do away with these problems, but they become, let's say, the source the, the subject matter of subsets that go on formulating what has gone wrong and coming up with solutions that address the problem inside our organization so uh, what i think it's crucial here in this point is that we didn't really look outside to other people and see what they needed our militants were all poor precarious students they're, they're no longer able to stay at the university uh, informal people that were moving from formal jobs to informal uh, labor uh, situations. So it, in the inside of our organization, these problems emerge. We didn't have to imagine what the people need, what classes are required. There is a sort of uh, interior emergence of this problem. And then we don't try to solve it for others. We try to solve it for ourselves. So how can I keep the people in this organization alive in need of, since they need more money, then they don't have time. How do you organize in those conditions? And in the cases where we found good solutions to this, then we offer those solutions to other organizations. And we come up with partnerships with trade unions, parties, social movements, student movements. Uh, and we say, look, we know a bit about how to deal with this. We know how to name that problem in a different way. And perhaps this is useful for you. And we can do things together. So that's basically what we do, where I find the crucial part is this, that problems start to emerge in, inside the, the organization. What I find useful about this, and I think it's a very Althusserian kind of ironic twist, that there is some truth to the idea that you only think when you can formulate the object inside your own system. So objects are something that you constitute inside an already move, a moving frame, right? Uh, it's just the case that the frame is not theory, the frame is organization itself. As you can see, this crazy di uh, diagram here respects the condition for what Badiou calls a model. The, the subsets that try to think through what we're doing and we didn't see, they are also collective organizations. And the problem is happening at a collective organization. So there is a homogeneity, be homogeneity between the two levels, right? I'm gonna shut up now because I think I already put you through too many arrows and, and, and slides. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity also to talk about this. Uh, half of what I'm presenting here to you guys, I didn't really come up with. I, I owe it to two guys in my group at the circle, Vito and Vanessa, and they came up with the, with the idea of what to present. I offered to put photos of them at the end of the presentation, but they, they were too embarrassed. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yes. Beautiful, man. Bravo. Nice work. That was uh, a tour de force, Gabriel. Um, 
it's over time and I want to respect um, your evening, your Saturday evening. Um, and that's lost already, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe you've already um, made plans to go out uh, given that it's actually quite nice weather, at least on the East Coast here in, in the US. But let me, let me open it up. I know some folks are familiar with Gabriel's uh, project that are with us. If they wish to jump in, that would be great. Or if there's any other general uh, questions, we've had a very nice chat about similar models, Gabriel, which you can reference uh, before we close. There's actually a really interesting psychosocial model that uh, Jesse uh, raised. Um, that's worth looking at. It's apparently a very similar structure. Yeah, so we, we did take a lot of inspiration from Labov and from, especially from Guillaume's work with therapeutic groups. Interesting. Very good. I don't want to monopolize. I want to turn it over. So jump in with any thoughts or comments or questions, please. Can, can you say something about how you avoid contradiction becoming antagonistic or how you avoid antagonism becoming destructive to the group? I mean, I think in the United States, we're more familiar with, with that trajectory. Um, I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, procedurally, you know, not necessarily ideologically, but um, what, what's the, what's the sort of inoculation against that? I don't know. I mean, we, we, there's, I don't know, no inoculation. I don't think we try to avoid that sort of thing. But one thing that I, I, it's nice that you mentioned, which is funny, is that uh, one one joke that people make in the circle sometimes is that uh, in Brazil, Mao Zedong has to be inverted because the antagonistic contradictions are the ones within the people and the, contra the, the, the contradictions with the ruling class are not antagonistic, right? So uh, it's much harder to put three guys from three different organizations uh, or from, let's say, different parcels of a class social composition, like people who are in informal work, people who are academics or uh, precar pre precarized students, and people who are manual workers in some form of continuation of more classical uh, working conditions, to put them together and to organize their interests in the same direction is much harder than to put a worker and his, uh, how do you call him, his boss in the same room. So uh, we, we, we play around with that idea that this is, uh, but I don't know, it's very funny. We, 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 we're studying this right now because for the last 10 years, of course, many people came and went to, to the organization. I think perhaps 400, 500 people. Uh, some people were, were unimpressed. Most people were unimpressed. In fact, in Brazil, when you join an organization, you expect to be joining some sort of revolutionary guerrilla group, or at least a group that pretends to be that while they study Marx. And they were disappointed both ways. Uh, but uh, still, we never had any sort of rupture Point. Like this, I cannot stand to break the group. I don't know why, uh, but I don't think that really happened. We have other sort of contradictions, but I think that, uh, I don't know, I, I, just out of experience, we, we didn't have to deal with that in those terms. But we do think that this is a, let's say, an organizational uh, process that is tailored to the sort of, of, of to the way that contradictions inside, let's say, the working class in Brazil appears. I think that peripheral economies, usually with their way that they mix over-exploitation and conditions of informal labor and formal labor and uh, the way that the middle class is structured, things like this, create very kind of pointy fragments. That's very hard to bring them together if you need them to relate at an ideological level. Whereas we totally abdicate from that uh, in, in a first glance. And we have that politics that if you want to fight somebody, really fight them, you need to build the fighting ring, right? And that thing you can do together with them, you can break his face later on. So we're worried about building the ring. If you want to break the guy's face afterwards, that's your problem. <laughs> but 
for some reason, when you spend a lot of time building something with other people, sometimes you forget what it is, you, why you hated them to begin with. So uh, that usually happens. Um, Gabriel, let's have one more intervention, one more thought, um, and then we'll just um, close it down. We're going to get together again. We'll just find a time to get to, to do our final um, session. And, um, you know, given that this went so well, maybe we can do another uh, activity together. We can, I don't know, uh, find out if there's interest. Uh, but let us hear if there's, there's got to be some burning um, thoughts or comments. Uh, jump in. I know we have uh, folks that were actually a part of this uh, effort uh, with us right now, um, based in Brazil, some based in the US. Um, and I, uh, first of all, yeah, Gabriel, please post the presentation slides on Slack. Um, one sort of, uh, yeah, nobody's jumping in, but one, one thing that, that interests me with what you're talking about here is um, this consequentialism of uh, interiority. Could you say a little bit more about that? I was slightly like confused, just a clarificatory question. Yeah, it sounded smarter than what I said though. Yeah, because we're good, we're good, <laughs> Marxist. We're good Marxists, we, we reject this uh, consequential paradigm. Um, but yeah, go ahead, what do, you, what do you mean by that? If you could be- No, like, I, I think that uh, 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 the, the, the main issue concerns uh, two ways to think about interiority, right? I think uh, if you, I mean, I think this is the basic problem behind, let's say, a quick reading of, of a lot of post-Marxist literature. The idea that, well, if you're, if you're trusting the autonomy of political processes, are you necessarily also trusting the immediate representation that people make of their own struggle? And I mean, not only you as somebody who's outside as an anthropologist, but you as part of that movement, do you need to trust our, our, or is the knowledge of what you're doing, is the thinking that's going on, not conditioned on your capacity to distinguish between, let's say, what you say or think or imagine that you're doing and, and what's actually taking place, right? Uh, isn't there some separation there? And I think that uh, you, can, you can come up with ways of distinguishing that from outside that are not exterior. For example, the anthropology of the name is an outside way of not being exterior about it, saying that that, dis that division is imminent. Just pay attention when you go there to the distinction between names, categories, and so on. But you, if you want to stay inside, if you're working on something and you need to make that distinction, sometimes it's not very easy to know what to lean against. Do you lean against the big authors? Like, I'll go back to Marx to decide if this was a good idea or a bad idea. Do you lean on feeling? Do you lean on your anxiety? Like, I, if this is making me uncomfortable, it's probably a bad idea. And I think that consequentialism means that we judge it by its effects. Meaning the distinct, the point of distinction is efficacy from inside. The point of distinction is not definitional uh, content. This is not how it should be done. That's not the best way to approach it. So I mean, by consequentialism, I mean that if you want to move even further into the interiority of a political thought, it means also to come up with ways of assessing what is effective and what is not effective, right? And I think that this is a bit, let's say, the principle for, for this subset that we come up with. We say, well, if you can maintain it, if there is desire to do it, if people are into it, and if it produces good things, so I guess that was a good path to take rather than the bad one. But we cannot assess that before something happens at the level of organization. Yeah. So consequentialism means that organizations think what organizations were thinking and not that anthropologists, militants, or uh, you know, philosophers, they think what politics was thinking. So yeah. that's why I began with that kind of uh, frustrating model relation graph, right? Because that's pretty much what's at stake. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I hope that you um, uh, continue to sort of pub publish uh, the, the findings 
of what what appears to be like a very unique uh, place uh, that you're in at the moment, which is this kind of retroactive looking back um, position. And it's really generating quite a lot of formal uh, knowledge that can be applied to other locations. So it's useful for all of us. Um, I really hope so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you for all the presenters for uh, Neo Cosmos and Robin and Assad and Gabriel. This has been a real blessing, honestly, uh, to, to be a part of this and hope you all have a great night. Uh, thanks for, you know, spending the last three hours with us. It flew by. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to Gabriel for such a stellar uh, detailed presentation. We'll post a video on YouTube for folks that uh, could not join us. And, um, and I'll send out a poll for the win the best time to meet for the final session. Okay. Great. Cheers. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.